As we now have a quorum, I call the meeting to, orders, to order. At this stage, I have apologies from Deputy uh, Maureen O'Sullivan, who is going to be replaced or substituted today by Deputy John Collins, and Deputy Mary Butler, who is <coughs> being substituted with uh, Deputy Frank O'Rourke. So uh, you are all welcome. Apologies from Kathleen Function. She is running late. Absolutely. Thank you. Apologies from Kathleen Function. Uh, Deputy Function. Uh, the normal requirement is would you please turn your phones either to flight mode or turn them off and I remind you it's not just the inconvenience of the meeting but the proceedings are both being broadcast and recorded. In accordance with standard procedures agreed by the Committee on Procedure and Privileges for Paper Committees, all documentation for the meeting has been circulated to members on the docu document database. I propose that we now go to private session to deal with correspondence and certain other matters. Is that agreed? Okay, we will revert back to public session. Uh, as we're in public session, I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 1721 of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter, and you continue so to do, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to that effect. Where possible, you should not criticise or make charges against any person, persons or entity by name, or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. The opening statements submitted to the committee will be published on the committee website after the meeting, and members are reminded of the long-standing practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Uh, good morning, Mr Honohan, and I'd like to welcome you here this morning. Uh, your full submission has been made available to the members, so at this stage I'd like to invite you to make uh, an opening statement or a summary of that submission. Yes, thank you, thank you. Look. Will we start with demand and supply? That's always where the undergraduates start, and the graduates do. So in the housing market, we have a demand and a supply curve. At the moment, the supply curve is flat. There are no, effectively no additional houses coming on stream. The demand curve is, as we know, hopping. Now, what does the market do in a situation like this? The market regulates by price. And the prices that we are being quoted at all parts of the market are uh, well, well uh, in excess of what can be afforded by th the economy. We have to have regard to the fact that competitiveness is impacted by the price of housing, the price of accommodation. And that is a, a matter of importance to the public generally. I think the housing market can be split into not three portions, but five portions. Tar starting with the homeless, we have, in fact, not just one homeless group, but two homeless groups. We have, uh, if you like, the, the group that was traditionally referred to as vagrants, uh, people who are living on the street. And we know from studies done in the past that there are people of this sort who have problems they even have problems feeling comfortable in accommodation which is provided for them sometimes. But uh, they nevertheless are a group that needs to be catered for and uh, we can't lose sight of that. I'm not sure whether any proposal uh, for uh, regulating market prices is going to make any difference to these because they have no money. The second part of the homeless uh, grouping is, is people who have found themselves in a position to have, they have become homeless by virtue of some domestic problem or a landlord who has increased the rent and they find themselves, because they are not on the housing list, they find themselves unable to secure alternative accommodation. There are two parts of the, of the homelessness group. At the other end of the spectrum we have two groups. They are the uh, private owner-occupier or buy-to-let uh, grouping, which uh, is, is not the concern of the public sector at all, but the public policy doesn't really concern itself with people who can afford to buy houses or people who can afford to become landlords. But in the middle is the group which we have traditionally dealt with as uh, candidates for public housing. And uh, it is this group which, the size of which is almost impossible to predict 
And that's the first task I would have suggested is, uh, of uh, this committee, is to find out what the views of the local authorities are in terms of how many people are looking for public housing, not just today, but in five years' time, in 10 years' time, in 15 years' time. It seems to me that uh, we, we went through a, a rather um, rose-tinted uh, period when we had uh, subprime mortgages, which, if you like, swept up the people who really, in, in reality, couldn't afford to to take a, a full um, mortgage on a house and to buy it. And, and it is this group primarily which is now falling back into the public housing um, uh, subset. As I say, the market, the market rations by price. But when the market fails, the state should regulate. That's, that's classic uh, um, case for regulation by the state, intervention by the state at all levels of the market and in whatever way is constitutionally permissible. And what I'm suggesting here is, it seems to me to be quite obvious, it's the big bang approach. We need a big bang in relation to uh, finding property for the public housing sector, for the subsidised housing sector, and that includes the affordable housing sector. That's a small group of people whose housing needs may be met by the uh, um, by facilitating or by, by funding them with uh, some state aid, perhaps part, part, part ownership arrangements, so that they can part acquire a property. But in general terms, subsidised housing is the sector part of the housing market which has, been, uh, which has been shrinking over the past, let us say, 15, 20 years. There's a reason for that, uh, in my view. Uh, I, the, um, the, the market... Uh, has, has shown uh, that government policy has, has um, um, shifted towards allowing the private market and private financiers to provide uh, for our uh, residential needs, for our housing needs. Uh, we don't have to go back too far to remember the Section 23s and the Section 27s and other tax expenditure uh, mechanisms for providing for housing. And uh, at their time, at their time they, they were a good idea and uh, they, they were, uh, one wonders what, what the what the city of Dublin or the city of Cork would be like had they not been in place at that time. Nevertheless, it was a decision, a conscious decision on the part of governments of the time and local governments to uh, invite on board the private sector and to allow the private sector to finance, uh, to take over, if you like, the provision of, of housing. And the, the part five proposal, which was a, a slight attempt to roll back on that, was, as we know, watered down. Now, we have a language problem. That's the old joke about uh, America and England being two, two uh, societies uh, sharing, uh, uh, what's the phrase, it's, uh, two societies, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can't remember the phrase, uh, not, not an agreement on the same language, there's a phrase like that. And we have a problem that the, the politicians and the lawyers seem to have a, have a difference of how they, um, how they interpret things. It's understandable enough. Lawyers tend to focus very clearly on the wording of a, of a document or a piece of paper, and politicians tend to veer towards the cliché. One example of that would be uh, Article 40.3, where uh, it's not a political ar article, but it is obviously a, an article that was drawn up at the time the Constitution was, was enacted, and it refers to unjust attack. This is Article 40.3. Unjust attack. And... Politicians look at that and they say, oh, that, that means any attack. Because an attack is, you know, by definition, you know, we all understand what an attack is. It's kind of an interference. It's, it's something that's uh, aggressive and negative, And therefore, it must be unjust. But the lawyers look at it a different way. They say it means an, an attack which is unjust, or meaning an attack which is not capable of justification. The attack is, quite clearly, an interference, a delimiting of some right but there may be a justification for it. So the unjust word means to the lawyer, what is the, where is the justice? The, the lawyers also look at the question of reasonableness. They say, what is the reasonable approach to taking it with this? And I'll give you an example of that, where uh, in the NAMA decision, that's a decision where NAMA, the NAMA legislation was challenged, the um, court was asked uh, to, to rule on the constitutionality of the... Um, 
uh, of the taking in by NAM of all the bad loans from the private, private banks. And uh, uh, the court, and I'm quoting now, said, it is only where the policy, adopted, policy position adopted by the Oireachtas is one which could, re could not reasonably be said to be required to achieve the end in question, that the legislation would be found to be incons inconsistent with the Constitution. All right, so a politician will read that, they'll say, oh, well, if it, was, if it wasn't reasonable, then it, you know, it's, it would be out. The Supreme Court would tell us to, to take it away and shred it and do it again. But that's not what it means. It means uh, where the policy position adopted is one which could not reasonably be said to be required. That means could not, on any, on any basis of rationality, that, that there was no possible way in which you could actually uh, see how the policy the objective could be achieved by the measure that was being adopted. It, it's not that it was reasonable, you know, fair enough. Not, that's not the phrase. It means capable of being reasoned, capable of having a rational basis. Now, um, I, again, I'm quoting from the head note, and head notes are quite useful things for, for uh, politicians if they want to look and see what, what the law means. He says, uh, this is the head note, in the same case, in determining the limits of what might be constitutionally permissible, Okay, now we're getting, we're getting close to the nub here. The interpretation of legislation, how the legislation properly interpreted was to be applied to the facts of any individual case was a matter for the courts, which had a significant role. However, it was important to note the limitations of that role. It was not the function of the court to consider whether measures were the best or even a good solution to the problem which such measures sought to address. That essentially means that the... the decision by the Arachthus as to how to tackle an area which required being tackled in the public interest is a decision which will be respected by the, by the Supreme Court. Now, I, I know it can be difficult for people to understand how, uh, how we can spend so much time in courts arguing about the minutiae of the, of the, of the um, legislation and so on and so forth, but at the end of the day, what the, what the Oireachtas doesn't seem to understand is that the courts spend most of this time trying to interpret what the Oireachtas meant to say. It is the, the intention of Parliament which is the, the paramount consideration in interpreting what the Oireachtas says. And occasionally you get a, a, an insight into uh, what, the, what the judges themselves think about policy. And I'll give you an insight of that. This is from uh, uh, Professor Kenner's uh, book on housing law, rights and policy. I don't know whether you've come across that. It was published in 2011. And uh, the, foot, the, the um, foreword is quite interesting because it's by Judge Lafoy of the Supreme Court. And she says, these are off-guarded off moments, if I can put it this way. She says, in Chapter 17, the contemporary challenges we are facing are identified. Stricter criteria for borrowers of housing loans, negative equity, and so forth. The author's observations at the end of paragraph 1707, outlining the roles which the law can play in, in the housing arena, set out a useful marker as to the approach which might be adopted in relation to meeting these challenges. So you say, oh, now we've got a judge actually crossing the line and saying, this is the sort of policy area which we might find interesting. So 1707, we look at that and we find law can play two roles within the housing arena. First, it can reflect the market reality of housing as a commodity and support the contemporary housing system such as it is, dominated by the market. Irish housing law has acted primarily and in some areas exclusively to underpin and bolster this housing market system. Secondly, law can be a source of autonomous values that can temper the market and structure it in different ways. It can draw on the reservoir of international jurisprudence, rights and principles to inform and creatively expand the conceptual framework of housing law, rights and policy. So far from the, far from the judges being anxious to stop everything and to, uh, to say this is our area of expertise, they are in fact trying to breathe life into often uh, sterile or cliché ridden documentation from, which emerges from the Oireachtas. One of the reasons why we feel often that the, the courts have a, I feel like a, a firm gr grasp on this and, and won't let go of it is because the Oireachtas tends to enact legislation which gives a discretion to the court. So they tend to feel, well, if we've got a, if we've got a, a, a difficult area here, on a case-by-case -case basis, we should give discretion to the court to do something. And the courts, I can just tell you from behind the scenes, they tear their hair out and they say, how are we to, how are we to tackle this? Here we have been given a discretion, but no guidelines as to how to operate it. So we have to look, we have to try and fill in the gaps 
and work out what it is that may be of some use uh, in, in, in providing, if you like, guidelines for the judges in dealing with such matters. I'm sorry, I'm going on a bit now, but I want to say in relation to judicialisation, the, the Law Reform Commission report on debt, which was 19, 2009, <laughs> essentially, um, said that we should try and, 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 go, try and depart from the judicialisation of insolvency. And here we are now, as I understand it, with a new proposal to, in, uh, to in, interpose another layer of, of judges into the housing market, into the mortgage arrears area. And I can tell you, the problem is not the law. It's, the law is there. The problem is actually giving the judges the authority to change the law, to, to apply a different set of, 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 uh, of guidelines. And of course, if, if a lawyer gets, gets, or if a judge gets the, uh, the, the instruction from the Oireachtas to say, consider in his discretion whether or not a person should be uh, dispossessed of his property, he'll say, well, I can't, I can't do this, uh, you know, with, with no, with, I can't make bricks without straw. And the first straw, this piece of straw I have to use is to use the presumption of constitutionality. And I have to presume that I'm not supposed to unjustly attack <laughs> the, the owner's rights. So at, at that level, they're, they're straight away, they're told, you know, you, you, have, you have the right to be sympathetic to the land, to the, to the homeowner, but you haven't got the right to actually give him any rights. Now, uh, I should say to you, uh, in relation, and again, I'm going on too long, is that um, uh, you, it, 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 I was of interest to note that um, at, the, at the time, just before the act was, or just before the Eroctus was passed, um, Mr. De Valera said, in future, the legislature will have to look after the public interest as it is doing today, the legislature. Are we going to shackle the legislature in the future in a way that is not shackled today and which it would be most unwise to shackle it? We are providing for that freedom of action to work in the public interest and to safeguard the public interest in the future, which the legislature has today, that and no more. I think the legislature ought to be enabled in its own judgment to decide what the public interest consists of and not the courts. Okay, so that's, it's, it's clear to me that when the phrase the public interest is used in the Constitution, that it was the intention of those who drafted the Constitution and those who adopted it, that's the public, that the public interest was a matter for the public to determine via their representatives in the Oireachtas. And in fact, uh, I quoted a, judge, a judgment there in relation to the, uh, the, the uh, I think it was Judge Denham who said it was quite clear that it was within the competence of the Oireachtas to make that decision, in other words, to decide what was in the public interest, what is the objective in the public interest which justifies the interference with the, uh, the property rights. Now then you come back to simply the question is, what interference? What interference is, might be uh, legitimate and what interference might not be legitimate? Where is the dividing line? Iraqis members say, we just don't know where the dividing line is. So if somebody tells us there's a possibility we might stray across the dividing line, we better not go there at all. That's. Uh, that's not the way Dev intended it. <laughs> he intended that the uh, public interest should be uh, promoted and secured by proactive legislation. Uh, of course, he's dead now, so I don't know. And that, that general approach to human rights and the limitation of human rights is echoed today in the European Convention on Human Rights which has a very similar approach to take. It says, no, no, we have to give the, the member state or the, the government the participating, the signatory government, uh, a, a considerable amount of latitude in, in relation to how they, how they operate uh, their own, their own uh, jurisprudence or their own jurisdiction in relation to matters of public interest. And it's even in America, it's the, 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 the um, jurisprudence is the same. That's say what they call in America eminent domain, the idea that the state can step in and say, well, hold on a second, that, that area of, of property can now be taken into state ownership because for, there's a public, a public interest in uh, securing a, be a better outcome for the, for the, for the public. And, and that's, that's the objective which uh, uh, the US federal governments and the state governments uh, have, have acknowledged since, since time immemorial. And, and yet we find people saying, oh gosh, the American vulture funds wouldn't be too happy about this. They're used to it. They've dealt with it before. They take, take the good and the bad. That's how it operates.
Uh, one or two people have indicated uh, they've been provoked by your comments. They, so I think you've, you've led to a number of questions. Fair I, enough. You don't mind, I'll, I'll let one or two of them in as we go along. Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, Deputy O'Brien. Sure, thanks, Chair, and, and uh, thanks, Edmund, for not only the, the presentation, but your interventions on, on this subject since last year, because I think a lot of us have been following them with uh, a great interest, and they've been very helpful to our considerations. I suppose you've made the position very, very clear. Um, but what I'd be interested in you doing is, is maybe applying your general observations to a couple of specific policy areas. Uh, and there's four. One is, uh, and you mentioned this in your, your interview with the newspapers last year, the issue around the use of compulsory purchase orders, whether for vacant units, uh, whether for land that's currently being land banked and, and could be introduced uh, either for social use or market use, uh, or for uh, portfolios of mortgages that have been bought over by vulture funds. And I'd just like you to talk very specifically about how your legal observations could apply to those sets of, of circumstances. The other one I'm interested in, particularly because of the topicality of today, we have the daft.ie rents report out, and when uh, the discussions in the last Oireachtas around rent certainty were being talked about, some politicians were saying that introducing rent certainty, linking market rent reviews to consumer price index, for example, could fall foul of, of the Constitution uh, and the so-called attack on property rights, and I'd be interested in your observations uh, on that particular uh, issue as well. Well, can I say, in America, they have no problem with rent control. <laughs> so, um, the difficulty in the Blake case, sorry, that's, that's the, uh, the case which challenged the uh, controlled rents, that's 1982, uh, was that the, the proposal at that time was to uh, impose controls uh, which effectively took money from one group in society and gave it to another group in society. And the Supreme Court at the time, which Judge O'Higgins gave the judgment, uh, he decided that, that was t t it was too, uh, too specific and unfair to other groups in society. In other words, the principles of equality didn't apply. Now, funnily enough, um, they, they actually went ahead, uh, it was Peter Sutherland, the Attorney General, and he then produced an, an alternative um, uh, legislation to try and shore up the, the system, sort of. And he went again before the Supreme Court, and he also lost. <laughs> so <laughs> um, the idea that rent uh, restrictions can be uh, specific and focused on particular sectors of the, of the, of the market uh, seems to me to be run, run the risk of falling foul of, 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 the, of the principle that, that where, the, where the, there is to be an interference with property rights, that it should apply to the, generally to the group uh, affected um, and, and not specifically to, to benefit one, one single group. As a matter of fact, one of the arguments uh, to be made in favour of buying them out is the, is the very fact that the Blake decision, the, 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 the prevention to, on, on rent control, uh, is, is, is there on the, on the books. If we can't restrict the rent, we might as well go and buy them. That, that's the point. You run no risk at that stage because uh, you're paying them compensation for what they have, what they paid for the, for the property you're paying them. And so it's not an unjust attack. Ipso facto, it's, it's not unjust if you pay them the compensation, let's say the market price which they paid for the place. Now, in relation to land, the Housing Act 1966 has compulsory purchase mechanisms for, for land, but for local authorities who require them for, um, for housing. I don't know whether you want me to cite the, the section on that. That's, um, it's, you know, it's, it's one, one of a, 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 a number of, of compulsory purchase mechanisms um, which, which, is, which has been used for a long time. Part 5 of the 66 Act says a housing authority acquiring land compulsory for the purchase of the Act may be authorised to do so by means of a compulsory purchase order made by the authority and submitted to and confirmed by the Minister in accordance with the provisions. And there was no bother about it. I mean, you know, it wasn't even challenged. We have the Electricity Supply Act here. I brought this into you just to show you. It's an old copy. 1927 Act, that backed that far. They said, let's have compulsory purchase for the ESB. Section 45, if and when the board thinks proper to acquire compulsory any land or to acquire or use compulsory any land, etc., etc., the board may by special order declare its intention to so acquire and to so acquire using such right. Never any problem. This, this is standard stuff, CPOing. You know, if there's a public interest there which is demonstrable, then there shouldn't be any difficulty about uh, a challenge. Just, sorry, just, just to, go back to the issue of rent certainty, so what you're saying is if, for example, legislation were introduced to apply rent certainty to the private rental market in general, 
from your point of view, there shouldn't be a constitutional issue of it, so long as it's it's meeting a, a general policy or social need. It's only if it was applied Deputy, to specific sorry, categories. Do you mean rent certainty or rent control? I mean rent certainty in terms of linking rent reviews to the Consumer Price Index, for example, which is a form of rent control that provides rent certainty. But my point is, if it applies to the rental market in general, it probably wouldn't fall foul of the law. It's only if it applies to specific sectors it might do. Is that what well, you're saying? Well, I go back to the NAMA legislation. There, if you like, there was a hard-fought case there. And uh, the Supreme Court um, were, were happy to authorise a, a very wide-ranging um, um, juris jurisdiction to the minister and, and to NAMA to acquire all sorts of loans, rubbish loans, good loans, bad loans. And, and to allow the minister to designate by, by um, statutory instrument what, port, what types of portfolios might be acquired, and so on and so forth. The objective was clear, which was to, 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 to um, prune down the bad banks and, and hand over their bad, bad portfolios. So once the objective is, is identified, provided the measure that's uh, being proposed uh, uh, tallies with that, and doesn't, isn't, isn't over the top, if you like, isn't disproportionate, then the, the court will... Uh, be, be happy to deal with it. Now, it does seem to me there's a distinction between rent control and rent certainty. Rent, rent certainty is a measure which, if you like, the landlord community has, has swallowed so far, but it is technically a, a, a limitation on, on their uh, property rights, as are many other things, for example, capital acquisitions tax or controls on interest rates and so on and so forth. All of these things are in the, in the nature of of measures which socially uh, society should adopt for the common good. And it's very difficult to, to see how a challenge to rent certainty, which is simply to, uh, if you like, fixity of, fixity of terms, to go back to the Land League. But rent control, m as I say, having, having gone through the, 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 um, uh, the, the cauldron of the Supreme Court twice, seems to me to be difficult to, to see, envisage how the Supreme Court might turn around and say, uh, we let it through this time. The courts generally have difficulty in, in rewriting old, old decisions. And it, the, 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 uh, re the, 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 the uh, legislation would have to be very finely taught. Uh, in relation to vacant units, I, in the, in the uh, um, executive summary, the phraseology I used, which was very carefully, it was uh, to... to, to uh, compulsorily acquire unoccupied and unoccupied and occupied homes about to be repossessed. And the way I look at this is that uh, if one goes back to the question of how many, uh, um, uh, how much is the public housing um, section, segment of the market going to expand, you have to say a lot of people are going to lose their houses because of uh, being dispossessed or repossessed. Um, and how, to, how, you, how do you find... Uh, um, um, the group of housing which it would be in the public interest to have a, 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 in the public housing portfolio, and that is any housing that's likely to be of use. <laughs> uh, ah, vacant housing is likely to be of use, and also housing where uh, the owners, unfortunately, have, have been served with a notice to quit, effectively, or a demand for possession. Once, once their right to redeem has been extinguished, the, the title deeds, in fact, vest permanently in the, in the, uh, in the mortgagee. And it's at that point that the state can say, we, we just acquire all of those without exception. We say, so it's a big bang. We acquire them all, we pay off the previous owners, and now we decide what do we do with them. Then we're into a different area. I mean, there's, there's a, a, an important byproduct here, which is that in relation to people in mortgage arrears, if the state steps in and buys up all the properties which... Uh, uh, which have been uh, the subject of, of uh, demand for possession or possession proceedings, then, then we've got uh, an instant uh, freeze on, on all dispossessions, on all evictions. And, and we sit back and we say, now what do we do with them? And the answer is, now we negotiate and put into place the mortgage to rent scheme that was proposed several years ago. We, have, we now have the option of saying, take, take that portion of the houses which we are now going to acquire by compulsory purchase and flip them over and say, now we're going to be rented to the people who live there. Yeah. Thank you. Deputy Coppinger. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, just to say that uh, I also welcome a lot of the comments that you made recently, um, particularly because I represent a constituency where residents are currently facing eviction from a vulture fund in Tyrrellstown. 
and also where the housing crisis is probably most acute. I um, wanted to refer to a couple of the legal issues that you raised. Um, firstly, uh, the, the whole tenor of your contribution is that uh, compulsory acquisition of public housing is arguably now for the common good and is legally justified. Um, if compulsory acquisition of dis distressed and vacant properties is legal and we have a major housing crisis, why hasn't the state done it? Is, and you're posing that question. Um, is it because the state is putting the interests of private capital ahead of the public good? Would you agree that that's what we can deduce? Be they foreign vulture funds or domestic banks? Ahead of the interests of ordinary people, um, would you agree that it must be ideological? Uh, because, and uh, I welcome the fact that you used a, what's a dirty word around here? You used the N word, nationalisation, because the idea that uh, the state should just sit back and not do anything um, when people are threatened with ruination of their lives. Um, and uh, I think it's good that you use the, that word, that the state can actually nationalise these vulture fund properties or distressed properties. Um, just a couple of questions about that. You in your statement advocate that the state would probably have to pay the full market price for the properties. But you also cite um, a European Court ruling um, saying that in exceptional circumstances they wouldn't have to. What are the except, exceptional circumstances under which they could be expropriated with, without compensation? Um, for example, is the current housing crisis that we have an exceptional circumstance, I suppose is what I'd argue, whereby the state wouldn't necessarily have to pay the full market price, would be, but would be justified in paying lower than the market price or even not compensating these uh, funds? Um, the other question is, do you know of any legal impediment to resuming local authority home building uh, on the scale that you mention in your, uh, in your contribution? You mentioned that 200,000 dwellings were built by councils and urban <coughs> housing developments between 1880 and 1960. Is there any legal reason why the state couldn't do that again that you know of? And just uh, the last two questions, would, had you considered that a state-ordered mortgage write-down, for example, would be cheaper than the state buying these properties and would actually be in the common good? Particularly, I welcome the fact that you've mentioned children because um, you mentioned that enhanced rights were given in the Constitution to children by the recent referendum and children are being really badly affected by the housing crisis. Um, in, I was in a court situation recently and a homeless woman made that point to the judge. What about the rights of children? And she made a very pithy you know, contribution because the judge said, oh, there's nothing I can do. And she said, well, what about the rights of children? And you've raised that question again in your contribution because could the constitutional rights of the child be a way of blocking evictions? Um, whether from rented or mortgaged accommodation, as well as the, the state compulsorily purchasing them as a way of keeping children in their communities where they attend school, etc. And so I'd be particularly interested to hear your views on that. Thank you, Deputy. Thanks. Mr Honahan. Well, there's quite a few questions there, but in relation to children's rights, it does seem to me that there would be a problem in, in, in an individual case where a child wanted to claim a constitutional right to be protected against dislocation, if you like, uh, that's, that's so, such an innovative uh, approach and, and runs counter to the general understanding of, of the rights, uh, the, the fundamental rights. It's an unexplored area. Uh, I don't know what we decided when we decided to put a children's referendum pa passed. I don't know what we decided were to be the benefits for children, but I'm sure this wasn't taken into account. And that's why I think um, the, the outright purchase is, is, is the better solution because it's, it's in a broader context, it's in, in the context of an overall solution for an overall problem. Um, in relation to local authority home building, 
there's no legal impediment on local authorities pressing on. There does seem to me to be a difficulty in, in the, uh, the um, reality of, of doing that because of, as I've mentioned, the difficulty in, in uh, sourcing skills and, and uh, materials. I mean, this is, we're going back to the, uh, the, the old Marxist system where you had to count the, count the bricks, make sure you had enough bricks. If everybody starts building at the same time, we start putting in new water pipes and we start putting in the new Lewis, Lewis line and so on, there's going to be a massive um, collision uh, uh, demand and supply for, for labour costs. And I see, I see that as a, as a major difficulty. It's far cheaper for local authorities to be handed properties which are already built, which are empty, or properties which are already built, which are not empty, but they're occupied by people who are about to be repossessed. And I personally don't want to see Ballymun again. So I think that is the difficulty for local authorities. They're going to say, what, how can we do this fast? And the answer is, let's build Ballymun again. It was quite a nice place, actually, but it, 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 was, it was demolished because it wasn't the social answer to what was required. And um, I, I unfortunately think that's the way local authorities uh, used to deal with them in the old days um, and, and now they have, they have a different view now but they may be reverting back to the old days if the pressure is put on them to build quickly. In any event, the whole point about this uh, proposal, the CPO proposal, is that we do have a, a window of opportunity to argue in court that there is a crisis and that the response of society to this crisis is to uh, seize <laughs> all the property that's available all the roofed space that's available and use it to best advantage. And I think that's once you state that in broad terms, uh, it, the, the actual minutiae, the nitty gritty of, the, of, the, of how it works out and who benefits and who doesn't benefit will, uh, will be left to the Oireachtas. As to whether you can do that without paying full market value, it, the European Court now would be very uh, loath to, to uh, um, approve that uh, unless in a situation where the actual value paid or the actual value of the property which was being acquired compulsorily was enhanced by some state action or some um, um, un unexpected um, economic uh, event. In that situation, the, the, um, the, actual, the actual value would be regarded as being something of a net value to that. But at the moment, we have the, other, we have the reverse. That is to say, the price they actually paid for these properties in the last three years is well below what they should have been paid, what they should have been paying to NAMA. They should have been paying to IBRC. We know that. It's well below that. So we pay them back all that money and wave goodbye to them. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Honan. Deputy Wallace. Thank you, Kira Luck. Um, thanks very much for coming in. Uh, your stuff is very good and uh, definitely stimulates thought. Uh, your point about the outright purchase um, certainly makes sense, uh, given that I think we all know that if we are to start building, uh, we're, we're going to continue to have problems for at least three years anyway, and uh, your outright purchase uh, would deal with it more quickly. But uh, do you think the argument for the public good in the Constitution uh, would override, uh, if, if it's challenged, the, uh, the property rights. Uh, and uh, given the neoliberal position of the established parties in Ireland, where we have the tendency to prioritise the interest of the private sector over the public interest, uh, do you think that uh, how would you deal how how would you approach dealing with that uh, uh, ideology that mental approach that they have to that and also give I mean given the fact that uh, this is also very much driven by the European Union I mean for example uh, we were not allowed to borrow money uh, at less than one percent to invest in infrastructure because the European Union is telling us, well, you must go through the private sector, through the PPP process, which you pay between 15 and 20 percent, 20, 15 and 20 times more for the money. A PPP can uh, cost up to 15 percent in cost of money, whereas uh, they, we boast that we can borrow for less than one. Well, so given that this uh, ideology uh, is well established in our political parties here, it's presently been driven by Europe as well, how would you foresee overcoming that obstacle? Uh, on the vulture funds, um, 
Well, it's, it's pretty obvious that the, they, they bought at fire sale prices and they were sold properties uh, at, at, on the day that they were sold for uh, very often less than half of the cost to actually put them there. And it was obviously very irrational uh, to do so. But do you know of any international um, example where, just, just supposing we had the will to actually compulsory purchase a lot of this back from the vulture funds, um, I mean, is, is there a, an international example of just how much they would be paid above what they paid? I mean, uh, they would obviously like to get what they think it's worth today. But uh, is there uh, an international example of uh, just how much we could get it back for above what they paid for it? I mean, for example, could it be linked to inflation? Could they be just paid uh, what it cost them in money, in price of money, since they bought them, uh, in order to compensate them and not have them at a loss, but uh, obviously um, create a situation where they wouldn't actually be at a gain? Um, my last question is completely different and probably not directly linked to what we were, we're discussing here, but um, when you were talking earlier about uh, how the courts deal with what comes down the tracks to them and uh, very often the lack of responsibility on the part of the state and uh, you talk about giving them uh, challenges without guidelines. Uh, in the area of, of how the commercial court have behaved in the last few years, um, uh, do you think that the commercial court uh, have behaved in a totally independent fashion in how it has dealt with major loans? Thank you, Deputy. Mr Honan. Again, a number of different questions. Uh, PPP, PF, or PFI is the English equivalent, uh, that's a uh, private finance initiative, the PPPs, uh, John Major's uh, idea. And um, what you're saying to me is that Europe says if you, if you want the 1% deal, you have to do it the PPP way. Uh, it's, 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 um, PPP, as somebody else described it, as welfare for capitalists. <laughs> uh, there are huge profits to be made out of PPP. And I think this country needs to actually turn its, turn its uh, back to PPP. It needs to say, right, that, that was an interesting idea for the 80s. And now we want to take the social control of what we're doing here. And I don't feel that uh, Europe is entitled to refuse us the money at, at 1%. Uh, there may be Eurostat problems, just there are Eurostat problems about everything nowadays, uh, in terms of the, the, the fiscal um, rules, which most people are now breaking. But we need to um, assert the right of the Irish government to at attend to a national crisis. Uh, in as, as economic and efficient a way as possible. And this certainly is an economic and efficient way, let's say, the immediate seizure of, of the vacant properties. Uh, there's an American proposal here, uh, which I dug up. Um, it's, uh, again, it's, um, it's a real estate crisis we are living with, he says. Uh, the plan grows in this, uh, plan goes in this simple fact is accordingly for municipalities or joint power authorities that they or their states established to enable coordination among multiple municipalities to discharge their legally appointed function by customary legally, le legally familiar means, and, and so on. So this is American law. I mean, the terminology is different, but the concept is the same. It's the idea that in order to call a halt to the uh, desification of American states because of subprime lending and so on and so forth, it was necessary or it would be desirable to acquire on a cooperative basis, acquire all the loans and then renegotiate all the terms uh, on, on a, a restructured and, and sustainable basis. As regards the actual price, uh, as, as regards the actual price that might be paid, it doesn't seem to me that there's any advantage in, in trying to work out a formula by which they get an extra 5% or something like that. It, the official arbitrator is set up under the 1919 Act, goes way back. The 1919 Act, he has all his little rules. And actually, I've been in several cases myself where I've been disappointed with the result from the official arbitrator where he has awarded less than I thought he was going to give for market value. So in other words, they're very tight, actually and the official arbitrator would look very clearly on how much was actually paid for this property 18 months ago or two years ago and how much could you sell it for now as part of a portfolio. I don't know whether you've been following the controversy about the uh, listing of 
of properties in, in uh, portfolio sales is some problem with the property registration authority. They have 7,000 properties on a, on a particular transfer. They're now refusing to release that deed. But in each document, they record the price for each property sold. Uh, <clears throat> and the prices that are recorded are quite astonishing. <laughs> So I came across one case the other day where uh, two apartments, one was in Tempelogue and one was, uh, I don't know, Tallar or something like that, and, and an investor, has, he was, his two properties were being repossessed, and the price for the one in Tallar was 151900 and the price for the one in Tempelogue was uh, 151900 So this is a completely artificial uh, um, uh, means of apportioning a huge multi-million pound paycheck. So, the figure is just plucked from the air. You can't imagine the receiver and the, and the American fund sitting down and saying, I'm not going to give you more than 152,000. Oh, no, I'll definitely have to have the 152,000 for that one in Temple Oak. These are just figures that are plucked from the air. <clears throat> and uh, there's, there's, a, there's an element of artificiality about them. That's where there may be the possibility of the arbitrator saying, now, come off it, lads. How much is this really worth? I mean, it's, what kind of condition is it in? Do you, did you have a value word on you know, so on. So there's, there's definitely the possibility of a prolonged uh, argument about how much the properties are worth. But what's interesting about a CPO is that once you serve the notice to treat, that's to say, we're sending out your notice, we're going to acquire that property, you get the keys. You don't have to pay them until you've worked out the price. That could take two or three years. Thank you, Mr. Holland. Yeah. Sorry, on the, my last question on the commercial court. Oh, yes, sir. Um, uh, a lot of people who have gone through the process don't, don't all feel that they've been treated fairly. Um, do you think that the commercial court has acted independently at all times in how it's made its decisions? Independently? Well, it's not really meant for me to comment, but it does seem to me that the, uh, uh, the summary, summary judgment process, and I've written about this, summary judgment process is one which... Um, uh, which, which puts the, the lay litigant at an extreme disadvantage. I've actually communicated with the Commission on Human Rights and written to them and told them that they need to address the rules of court which put the uh, lay litigant, uh, 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 which render the lay litigant ineffective. He cannot, cannot effectively participate. They come before me uh, at the earliest stages, not for the commercial court, but for ordinary debts of less than a million. And they come before me and they say, what do you mean an affidavit? What's an affidavit? And you have to tell them what an affidavit is. And they, then they go away. They can produce an affidavit and it's rubbish. <laughs> it contains kind of stuff that somebody told them in a pub to put in. And then you say, all right, let's tell me now what your story is. How did this come to be? What did you borrow the money for? And we go on at length. And eventually I'll say, now that's very interesting. Put that in an affidavit. Now, I don't think that happens in the, in the commercial court. I don't think there is the, if you like, uh, debt or friendly approach. One of the difficulties with debtor-friendly approaches, or indeed with lay litigant-friendly approaches, is, and to be very practical about it, I've heard this comments from both sides, is that a judge will say, well, look, I did my best. I explained what the, what the nature of the procedure was. I explained to him how, you know, how he might develop a point here, there, and everywhere. And then I turned around and ruled against him. And I was told I was a bastard. But I was doing my job to try and explain where, where he was at and what he needed to do. So eventually I give up. This is what one judge told me anyway. You just, so the, the impression given, certainly, in the commercial court and elsewhere in the high court is that uh, big money talks, omnia prisa monitor is a, is a ma legal maxim we have. Ev everything is presumed to have been correctly done, and that certainly is a presumption which the courts apply to the bank's paperwork. And I've found it not to be true. Thank you, Mr. Honan. Uh, Deputy O'Dowd? Yes, I find that, that your, your points are very thought-provoking indeed. Uh, but very worth examining in full, which Quinty will do. I just have one question, really. I live in a constituency, it's a rural constituency, but I, we have two large towns in it, in County Loud, Rotland and Dock, and there aren't actually many vacant properties that I'm aware of in the county at all. In fact, the biggest problem is people can't get a place anywhere, no matter what they might pay, they're all occupied. So one of the key pressures comes on the question that, which you raised about in the public interest, where the local authority or whoever needs to build more houses, and and it's the planning acts and potential delays. If the purchase is dealt with under, if it's reluctant or a seller uh, through, the, through the regulations of compulsory purchase. But the question is that if any planning changes are recommended nationally, I presume, in the public interest to bridge the time or other issues which would be time related, uh, would you think that that would not 
be a problem in terms of constitutional challenges because I think one of the huge issues is that right you have the land you're ready to go and there's huge uh, unnecessary delays even the fact if you were to say you know like we do for for uh, significant industrial development that there would be a branch of say the the on board planola fast track the planning on these houses a one-stop shop in a six six week period of consultation or whatever with those, but only in the public interest and obviously uh, for a limited time period as well would that make sense or would it would it pass muster do you think I not any difficulty with that. Um, the situation with planning is that uh, you can rewrite your planning laws overnight. You could have a derogation, for instance, in relation yes, to, yeah. to particular types of housing, a particular square footage of housing. Uh, you could allow them to proceed. Obviously, you wouldn't be too keen on, on, on allowing a derogation from building regulations. No, which is all, no. But from the planning point of view, I mean, you go back to um, uh, the, the pre-board plan all the days when it was uh, the minister mm. would sign off on an appeal. Yes. <laughs> the uh, Jimmy Tully is a famous case. But, um, <laughs> there's, there's, there's no, from a constitutional point of view, if there's a crisis, which there is, yeah. um, let's not play around with joke solutions like modular housing, you know. <laughs> let's, get, let's get in there and do what's needed. I think the big problem with that you mentioned Ballymun was the fact that it was entirely inappropriate for families, and particularly children, yeah. to be living in high-rise accommodation with no proper recreation areas. But I, I think if, if you're saying, or if the import of what you're saying is that if the government and the Rockers were to decide that yes, we would fast track and shorten a bridge that time significantly for social and affordable housing, that there would be no constitutional barrier. And I can confirm that, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Deputy Cowan. Chairman, uh, thanks, Mr. Horner, for your presentation. Just one question uh, in relation to buy-to-let properties and those that are caught in the sandwich are those tenants, obviously. Uh, do you believe that there's any potential or possibility for legislation to safeguard their interests in order to allow them more time to find alternative forms of accommodation in the event of the property being uh, taken over? Thank you. The position about uh, tenants in buy-to-lets and the appointment of a receiver who takes the, the keys, if you like, and tells the tenants to get out, is that the, uh, the owner for whom the receiver is acting uh, is, is in the same shoes as the, as the landlord. So he has certain obligations um, under, the, under the PRTB uh, arrangements and minimum terms and so on and so forth. Again, I don't see any reason why... Uh, uh, why uh, there shouldn't be a rider attached to any sale of a property which is a buy-to-let, which would ent entitle uh, a tenant to, say, for instance, first option. It would entitle a tenant to um, the maximum amount of time uh, within which to find a, a suitable alternative accommodation uh, and uh, an, an application to court if that, if that weren't possible. Uh, there doesn't seem to me to be any difficulty, except the fact that the pur purchaser of the buy-to-let, let say the bank who's selling it, might say the value of that property now is going to go down because I'm stuck with a, with a tenant uh, who, and this may take me 15 months or 18 months to, to shift him on. That's, that's the difficulty. So he may